a woman gets kidnapped in Uganda, some hopes for peace in Afghanistan, and we're gonna take a look back at a few more of my interesting packages over the last 16 years. That's coming up on this episode of The Hot Zone. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, Chuck Holton here. Uh, Some bad news out of Uganda. I got word this morning that a woman was kidnapped uh, while she was on a safari in a national park there. She's 35 years old and she was kidnapped along with her driver. They were with another elderly couple, but the kidnappers let that couple go and that's how they got word to authorities. Ugandan authorities are apparently mounting a giant manhunt, or in this case, woman hunt, uh, for that uh, American woman who is uh, still missing and feared uh, to have been moved into the Congo, which doesn't bode well for her. Apparently, the kidnappers have called and demanded half a million dollars in ransom, And so let's talk a little bit about kidnapping here. Uh, I did a uh, Frontlines episode a while back about kidnapping. And uh, in that, I went through a course about basically how not to get kidnapped and what to do if you are kidnapped. Take a look at some of that. And the movement is towards your wrist. All I'm doing is putting it under tension and rock. And you look at that and go, wow, there's no way I can escape. I mean, I feel that feels really tight, right? You can do that one. <laughs> really? I feel like Superman. Over the last couple of days, we've learned how to get out of handcuffs and pick locks and all sorts of good information that we might need to know as we travel overseas. Today is the final exercise. I'm not really sure what's gonna happen, but I think it's gonna be interesting. The exercise begins with a simulated kidnapping. I'm taken to a room in the hotel and have a pillowcase taped over my head. They dump water on me. Then the real fun begins. Ow. What are you doing here? I'm just a tourist. I know this is all a game, but the taser sure feels like the real thing. The wet pillowcase makes it hard to breathe. I don't know anything. I'm just a tourist. My abductors leave, promising more torture when they return. I have to escape, but I'm really worried I won't be able to get the handcuffs off. But then the training kicks in. We're gonna run through the Walmart. In some ways, doing this exercise in a major American city makes it easier. I wanna go out a different door than I came in, so I'm gonna go out through the service center here. I speak the language, know the culture, but so do my pursuers, and they know what I look like. All right, so I gotta change my appearance somehow. We cashed some clothes last night, and we're gonna change our appearance a little bit and, and pose as skateboarders. First thing I got to do is get rid of this old man mustache here. So this thing's got to go. Transition complete. I'm now a skateboarder. We made our way from the outskirts of town to the Las Vegas Strip, about 12 miles. The skateboards came in very handy. So did the local bus system. But when you're being chased, everyone looks suspicious. That guy over at the bus station seemed like uh, he was paying a little bit too much attention to us. We were given various tasks to accomplish throughout the day. Finding a weapon, picking a lock. By late afternoon, we got the signal to bring it in. Mission accomplished. Hey, how you doing? Good, man. (laughs) Good disguise, good cover. Thank you. These are the kind of skills a man hopes he never needs to use. But for all the places we go, I'm very glad to have learned them. 
See, in many countries around the world, kidnapping is really the only growth industry. And uh, one of the things you need to know is that in order to avoid being kidnapped, you can still go to places like that, like Uganda, and go on safaris. But it's very important that A, you make sure that people don't know that you're going to be there. Uh, you, they don't know that you're coming. Believe it or not, kidnappers like to surf Facebook and find people who are planning their vacations ahead of time. Uh, I never accept a ride from somebody who's waiting for me at the airport with a sign. Uh, you know, you walk out of the airport and there's those people standing there with signs with people's names on it. It's very easy for kidnappers to go up and read those signs, Google the names on the signs, find somebody they think might have a lot of money, and then pay off that driver or threaten the driver to go home for the day. And then the kidnapper takes a sign and picks you up and takes you someplace you don't want to go. So I don't take an offered ride when I get to the airport. I always go to a taxi that isn't expecting me or I'll take an Uber. That's one good way to avoid getting kidnapped. So uh, it's there, there's always the chance that you're going to end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. But it's still, it's very rare. The vast majority of situations, kidnappers have time to work through that OODA loop, that, that observe, orient, decide, and act loop in order to make plans to do something bad to you. And if you find ways to kind of break up that process and get in that loop and uh, keep them from making it to the act portion, then you can keep yourself a lot safer. And that's one of the ways that I've tried to keep myself safe throughout the years doing this job. Okay, so let's go on to Afghanistan. There are new hopes for peace. The president, Ashraf Ghani, uh, says he has a four-step plan to bring peace to Afghanistan. Now, unfortunately, that plan includes convincing other entities like Pakistan and Iran uh, and even the United States to step out of the way in Afghanistan, get their interests out of there and allow the Afghan people to work together. That's obstacle number one, because Pakistan and Iran both have very strong desires to influence the process there. And of course, the United States does too, although we're wanting to really influence the process in a positive way by enabling uh, people to uh, be self-reliant, by enabling the military there to be able to defend themselves. And that's been a long 18-year process and very, very expensive, both in uh, treasure and in blood of American troops. So uh, the second obstacle to that process is just simply money. The president, Ashraf Ghani, says that they want to uh, wean Afghanistan off of the American dollar. We've been spending a billion dollars a week in Afghanistan for legitimately 18 years. And this has uh, gotten so expensive, nine oh, over all just almost a trillion dollars in expenditures. I mean, not to mention, uh, what is it, 2,900 American troops dead and over 20,000 wounded over there. Uh, but we've created a dependency culture in Afghanistan. And there's so much graft, there's so much fraud, so much deception that goes on to get parts of that money. And those people don't want to give that up. So to give you an example, we've given almost 200 Black Hawk helicopters to Afghanistan. But in the process of giving them 200 Black Hawk helicopters, there's only about like 16 of them that even work. There aren't enough pilots that we, we haven't been able to train enough pilots to fly any of those helicopters. And we haven't trained enough uh, Afghans to work on the helicopters. And I wouldn't trust them even if we did. And so we are, we, we are paying contractors to work on the helicopters. They can only work on those helicopters in certain places that are deemed to be safe enough for contractors to live there. And those typically aren't the places where the helicopters are needed most. So that's very inefficient. But the worst thing of all is that the Afghan military generals love to use those helicopters to ferry their friends around and to take joy rides and to do things that don't further the mission of the military of Afghanistan. It's gotten so bad that the U.S. military it said that they were going to impose a fine of $100,000 per flight hour on Afghan generals who misused their ability to use those helicopters. But you know what? That didn't even stop them because the $100,000, guess where that comes from? You and me, the American taxpayer. So they don't care. They just keep flying them around, having fun with them, taking them home on weekends or whatever. And so now the uh, American generals are saying, we're going to up that fine to $150,000. I mean, really? Like, 
does it not occur to you that these guys don't care? Does it not occur to you that they just are uh, taking advantage of the largesse of the American people? And so Ashraf Ghani is right to say he wants to wean the Afghans off of that because it's creating corruption. It's, it's, I mean, look, corruption has always been a problem over there. Corruption is going to be a problem in Afghanistan, but it's not going to get any better if we're handing out free money to everybody that walks up. There have been hundreds of thousands of ghost soldiers on the books in Afghanistan for years. Ghost soldiers being soldiers that don't actually exist, that we're paying their paychecks every month. And those, that money is going right into the pockets of the generals who are apparently overseeing those, those troops. So there's a lot that's broken in the process. We've been trying to train the Afghan troops for legitimately decades, and they still, uh, you know, we're running around like less than 30% literacy. The only literacy that they are given is uh, we teach them to read the Quran, which basically teaches them that we're the enemy. And so we've run into this huge problem of the green on blue, where it's still going on, where uh, Afghan troops turn on their trainers, uh, the Americans, and kill us uh, while we're there living with them. So it's a real mess that's going to have to be fixed. But uh, Ashraf Ghani, he might have a good idea, but putting that idea into practice in a place like Afghanistan that still hasn't figured out toilets and beds and light bulbs and, and uh things like that, paved roads, is going to probably be a very difficult thing to do. Bottom line is, we want out of Afghanistan. The Afghans want us out of Afghanistan. And so we ought to go to the model that I've been talking about for a long time. And that is to say, we defeated the Taliban once. We got them out of government. We put a new government in place. You, the new government of Afghanistan, can make it anything you want. You can make this country anything you want. It doesn't have to be a Jefferson de democracy. We don't care. We're going to leave. We're going to take our money with us. And the minute we think that we get the inkling that Afghanistan is a threat to the United States again, we're going to come in and bomb the crap out of your country again and s let you start over from scratch. And we'll keep doing that as many times as is necessary until you guys get it right. That's just my opinion. That's not journalism. That's just my opinion. But I'm going to put that on top of what's actually going on over there just because I've been watching it. I've spent probably two years of my life in Afghanistan reporting on this mess. And uh, look, the troops that are there, including my own son, are working hard. They've got good motives. They're, they're winning at every level that they're allowed to win on. Where the war is being lost is where wars are always lost, in the halls of power in Washington, D.C in the Pentagon, in the, the, the politically correct atmosphere that is absolutely ruining the United States of America, and especially the culture of the military. I was on the phone today with a public affairs officer in Afghanistan asking for a, a, an embed, asking for some interviews, asking for some, some uh, content out of there to let the American people know what our sons and daughters are doing in country. You know what he told me? He said, there is no story in Afghanistan about Americans. The Americans are not the story. The Afghans are the only story that's over here. And I said, you know, that's kind of a bad thing to say to the father of a boy who's serving over there. If we've got 12,000 troops in Afghanistan, are you going to literally tell the families of those 12,000 troops that their, their sons and daughters are doing nothing of note? There's nothing that we need to be reporting on about the Americans over there? Talk about a good way to make us angry and lose support of the American people for what the uh, American military is doing over there. Morons. Wake up, U.S. military. So, I'm sorry, I get a little passionate about that, especially because my own son is uh, putting his life on the line over there right now. And I've watched so many sons and daughters come back without their lives or limbs because of the war in Afghanistan. So how about we, number one, start telling the American people about the good work that our men and women are doing over there. The military has been losing in the media battle space for so long because of timidity, institutional timidity. Somebody in that chain of command is like, oh, I don't want the news to get out about what we're doing because it, it might make me look bad. Say They might say something negative about us. Well, you know what? You should be proud of what our troops are doing. And if you're not, then you should be changing what our troops are doing while they're there. They should be doing things that make us proud. And if they're not, 
then you're not doing the right things over there. And if they are, then you should be shouting it from the rooftops and allowing the media in there to tell the story. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go on and talk about some good things that the U.S. military did back in, uh, I don't know, a few years back in Ethiopia, back when they still allowed U.S. Uh, uh, media to embed with U.S. troops and to do the right thing by going in and trying to take a proactive stance in, in Africa by uh, helping of people avoid the call of radical Islamic jihad. This is a medcap in Diridawa, Ethiopia. Check it out. This part of the world has received lots of attention lately because of pirates attacking container ships and taking hostages. But piracy isn't the whole story. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Radical extremism is as much a problem in Africa as it is in Afghanistan. U.S. strategy here is to get the military involved earlier, deny the terrorists a safe haven, and strengthen relations with local governments. We are building their stability, helping them build a better lifestyle, and in the end, that does promote a more stable region and keep extremism at bay. In the past, terror organizations found willing recruits by offering hope in this area crushed by poverty and disease. Now, military doctors simply treating for internal parasites, from which nearly everyone here suffers, can help fight extremism. Some of the physicians here are calling it the global war on worms. Hundreds of people have been showing up to wait in this empty field over the last 24 hours, wanting to be seen by the military physicians that are here for the medical clinic today. For many of these people, it might have been five years or more since the last time they saw a doctor, and it may be another five years before they get this chance again. You can catch more flies with sugar than you can with vinegar. Major Michael Wheeler heads up the mission. His team includes 30 highly skilled personnel from all services, including doctors, dentists, pharmacists, and even a veterinarian. But despite all they have to offer, they don't want the credit. What we want to do is we want to boost the image of the health ministry, local government officials, even the local police. What this does is it gives them a chance to see their government in action and know that their government does care about them and they are working for them. A stronger local government leads to a more stable society, which will hopefully make us all a bit safer in the long run. Scott Regick left the elite special forces for civil affairs because he saw the effectiveness of this unique kind of mission. I think these people realize that we Americans were a compassionate people. After a mission like this, they don't wish us any ill. But as a father of two kids, which I do miss a lot, uh, to see these kids, to put a smile on their face, to know that we're doing good for them, it fills my heart with a lot of joy. Another benefit to this strategy is the cost. Humanitarian aid is one of the cheapest military missions there is. For example, this entire two-week deployment cost about as much as a single tank of fuel for a large military cargo transport. Not only that, but this kind of preemptive strike, stopping terrorism before it takes root, is cheaper where it really counts, in human lives. During their 12-month deployment, this unit didn't lose a single member to enemy fire. As our command develops, we would like to extend this friendship to even more parts of Africa. It's been a great experience to come out here and help these people uh, to work in conjunction with the Ethiopian government. It's a positive experience for us. It's a positive experience for them. I think we're gonna, this is going to go a long way. Chuck Holton, CBN News, Diridawa, Ethiopia. All right, folks, that's going to have to do us do it for us today on The Hot Zone. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing. We are trying to change the face of the media one person at a time, one viewer at a time. This, the, the, the technology that we have available to us today allows you to take a much more active role in what we're doing in reporting the news and shaping the news for the better. See... Journalistic standards say you should only report what's happening. You shouldn't get involved or have anything to do with it. Well, you know what? Those days are over. Unfortunately, so much of what the media does nowadays is try to insert themselves in a way that crafts the narrative politically. Well, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is give you the option of reaching through the camera and touching people's lives when they're on their worst day and giving them a chance to make their life better and improving their lives uh, immediately, directly from your hand to theirs. 
And so uh, thanks for being a part of it. This is The Hot Zone. I'm Chuck Holt. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.